This is the Southeast Ohio Woodland Interest Group. Carnivores in our forest. Really question. Mm -hmm. Does carnivore mean a meat eater, something that eats meat? But to a biologist like my carnivore actually belongs to the order carnivora. And not all of those species eat meat, like the giant panda. They are defined by, by their teeth that I will bore you with and a common ancestor. And there are 13 families that are existing now and 270 species in the world. So that's it for carnivora. There are six families and 13 species in Ohio. Species might need your help more, which species really don't need any more help. There are three species you are not likely to have in your woods. The, sh the short-tailed weasel is also known as the ermine. To trappers, ermine is anything that's white coat, any weasel in its white coat. Its tail is less than 40% of its body length. But the reason why you won't see it in your woods is because its distribution is confined to the northeastern part of the state. It's a very good the species of concern and we're, we're still looking into it. We just don't know a lot about the weasels. They just don't come down this far south. Another is the badger, not a woodland species. It was never common in Ohio, it is becoming more common, and it's only found in the western half of the state, in Ohio. And here's one of my favorites. This is the least weasel, which is the smallest carnivore in the world, and it's barely larger than the main prey, which is the mice. They inhabit meadows, marshes, brush areas, and agriculture fields, but they do occur in southeastern Ohio, so they may be on your property, in fact. The only way I ever get specimens of these weasels is when somebody's cat hunts it in. <laughs> so they do occur in this area. They do occur frequently enough for house cats to find them and bring them home. So what species do you will probably have in your woods? Raccoon stripes, skunks, and possums. Or possums. I put an asterisk by that because it's not really a carnivore. It doesn't really fit anywhere. It's our only really marsupial. It's not even a true mammal. So, but it fits best with those top three species. Raccoons, possums, and skunks just kind of go together. There are trouble, troublesome weasel predators. And then we have three canids, coyotes, red fox, mink, and otter, which are associated with water. Bobcats, which are less common, but getting more common in bears, which are state endangered. Different people have different values for wildlife. So you may have a pleasure just hearing coyotes howling at night. Pleasure just knowing that they are there, that the, that the deer are there, the raccoons are there. There's economic value, value in the fur trade, value in the sale of licenses for us. We certainly we're funded largely by deer hunting, hunting and trapping, animal watching, bird watching, butterfly watching. Ecological value, every species has a place, a role to feel, whether we like that species or not. They may not be um, native like a coyote, but they come in and fill the niche that we empty for them, so they still have a place. Other species are coming back that were, we extirpated and they still fill in place and make the ecosystem healthier. Ecosystems are very, very complex with lots of food webs and lots of dynamics. And when you take one little piece out, there's just a ripple effect for me as, as a biologist. It gives me a glimpse inside the lives of animals, which also helps some biologists even, even explain some things about humans. All animals need, which is food, water, shelter, and space. These, where it lives is this, this kind of ambiguous term known as a niche. It's called a multi-dimensional space. It's what it does, how it exists, where it lives, what it eats, it's everything about it. No two species can occupy the exact same niche. Everything about its habitat and its behavior goes into that niche it fills. And it's rare that two species would fill the exact same niche. Raccoons are the world famous habitat and dietary generalists that eat anything that live anywhere. They're adaptable, they're smart, and they thrive on the disturbance that we cause. There's actually more raccoons now than there probably ever has been, and they're at greater distribution than they had before. Bobcats, on the other hand, are dietary special. Most carnivores don't eat just meat, but this carnivore cats do. Generalists tend to be everywhere. They're adaptable, and they also tend to be overabundant, easily become overabundant, and become nuisance animals. Specialists have a narrow distribution and they are more likely to become endangered. I said I spent at least six years studying raccoons in Chicago of all places. There are more raccoons in Chicago than there are here. I use roadkill surveys for raccoons, possums, and skunks, and woodchucks. I also use bow hunter index, which if you're bow hunters, record the number of hours in the stand and they record how many species they see each day that they're in the stand. And so from that, I get an index of number of sightings per 1,000 hours on the stand.
So when plot that over the 24 year mean for raccoons is pretty level. Um, if we brought this on back to the 1980s, we'd see where the raccoon started to climb plateau, but it is at an all time high. And so the 34 year mean is 34 animals per thousand hours. And there's another one of my favorites, striped skunks. Um, and they don't have many predators. If you study moths or caterpillars or anything else, you know that this is called a plasmatic coloration. It's a stark contrast, black and white. But these animals want to stand out. Because that standing out says, hey, leave me alone. I'm bad news. You don't want to mess with me. So that black and white stripe says, leave me alone. We know why. So the trend has been going down. You can see that their 24-year they're mean is about five five animals per thousand hours. They occur in a much lower density than raccoons. I'm not real worried about skunks with them going up and down because overall I think we'll, we'll shoot back up in a year or two and shoot back down. That's the way skunks and opossums oscillate. Um, skunks can be heavily impacted by diseases. And speaking of opossums, it's another one of my favorite critters because you can't work with raccoons and skunks without getting your hands on some opossums. So. But there are America's, North America's only marsupial that they survived the, uh, the rise of the simple mammals that, and they're the only species that did. They're very, very successful, considering the size of the brain case, which is very, very small. Um, they raise a prodigious number of young per year. <clears throat> and they, they are the simple mammals. They have a pouch like a kangaroo. The young are about as big as your thumbnail when they're born, and they know to climb in and climb into the pouch and attach to a teeth and, and hang on. So that these guys are common in Ohio. Um, we have a 24 man of about 8.4, and the decline there is becoming a little more worse for me. They're still very abundant. They're not rare. They're not going away. They're not being um, extirpated or anything. But we do what we are seeing a declining trend. Like I said, the possums tend to go up and down with the bad winters um, and food supply. But uh, when we start getting a downward trend this long, it starts to be a little concerned. What do we do to manage for? For, for these adaptive mesopredators. Well, really not, we don't do much, or we shouldn't do much. You can maintain um, healthy den sites, like snacks and hollow logs. You can maintain natural food, no feeding them, uh, soft mass, hard mass. But they're great adapters, and they, they're common in well-managed forests, they're common in poorly managed forests, they're common in farmland, suburb cities. Um, they're, they're common everywhere. So raccoons adapt much more easily and exploit things much more easily than skunks and possums do. So raccoons will rise faster in abundance than the other two. So you actually get the whole community out of the lab when you get um, when raccoons become overabundant. More appropriate to talk about what we do when we have too many of these guys. And uh, the major problem and the big reason I really preach about controlling raccoons is because of the problems with damage and mostly with disease because they, they, they can have a number of diseases that are transmissible to domestic animals and humans, can, including some fatal ones. Structural damage going in through roofs and the attics, they can um, get into garbage cans, and the worst thing they can do is leave latrines or big piles of, of scat in your attic or in your house or in your deck. Because <clears throat> raccoons carry a specific round worm, the raccoon round worm, which doesn't hurt the raccoon, and they shed just thousands of these spores and eggs in their feces. Um, humans or other incidental hosts ingest those, the larvae um, will migrate to, to the central nervous system. It causes neurological damage, and they also have a fondness for the optic nerves that cause blindness. It's usually seen when there's a problem with seeing children, which is sad, but children are the ones that are like, they put their hands in dirty stuff and then put them in their mouth. I always preach for proactive management, reactive things you can do if you have a raccoon in your house. Is there are audio, audio visual things that make flashing, flashing lights and lots of loud noises. I had one of those when I worked in Chicago to test on coyotes, which would work with coyotes. The raccoon got a hold of it and chewed it to pieces. <laughs> it was completely destroyed. <laughs> So there are olfactory things that they sell at Lowe's, I doubt they work. There are barriers, exclusion barriers that will work, but you need to get the raccoons out first. So there's trapping and translocation, which is moving them somewhere else, but then you're going to have that potential of moving, moving diseases, parasites, plus every place has enough raccoons already. So, And you, you're not allowed by law to move them anywhere other than somewhere else in your land. They're just going to come right back.
So traveling and euthanasia tends to be the, the answer. A better way to go is in proactive management with ceiling places where capping chimneys, securing garbage cans, and removing pet food and other, other things that might encourage raccoons, bears, coyotes, all those sort of critters that you don't want to enter around your house. So we have three canids in Ohio. Coyote was not originally found in Ohio. In fact, when I was a kid, there weren't any coyotes um, east of the Mississippi River. Now they are coast to coast. As we removed all the large predators, the wolves, the cougars, the mountain lions, and we opened the forest and we said, hey, come on in. But they're here now and they're not going to go away. And so there's an increasing trend, if I ever saw one. The landscape is certainly not saturated yet. Coyote size varies geographically. I get questions about a lot as, as whether they have wolf DNA in them now, or dog DNA. When coyotes began to push eastward, they picked up some dog DNA. When it reached the Great Lakes, some of them split off and went up around the Great Lakes, back in through the New England states and back down, and they picked up more wolf DNA. So the amount of coyote DNA is like 99% of them, there's up to 1 or 2% dog DNA or wolf DNA. The genus Canis is just troublesome in that all of their members can interbreed and have fertile young. So dogs, coyotes, wolves. So the only true, true coyotes are the ones in the West. They breed in February, they usually have their young in bins in April or May. Some grad students dug out a gym for radio collar female and pulled out 11 pumps and one litter. You go out and have those big coyote round up and you shoot a bunch of coyotes and you knock the population down, well the litter side is probably going to go to 40 to 10 the next year and within a couple of years they're going to be right back where they were. Coyotes have this um, density dependent reproduction mechanism so if you go out and you, um, let's say you go out and have this big coyote round up and you shoot a bunch of coyotes and you knock the population down, well the litter side is probably going to go to 40 to 10 the next year and within a couple of years they're going to be right back where they were. They use multiple dens and sometimes they use them consecutively. They have ecological value. They do control small rodents, or rodents, mice, rats. They love the black bears. They love pawpaws. That's all they eat during pawpaw season. <laughs> we documented them still in the eggs out of Canada goose nest. So they do do some good. Do coyotes eat turkeys and turkey eggs? They're not as easy to pick out, but they definitely will take adult turkeys if they can. General removal is when you just go out and you harvest or you, you knock down the population. The sick removal is when you have a problem animal that's around your house that's getting too close, it's lost its fear of taking out livestock owners that are experiencing depredation, find that specific animal and get rid of it. The problem with general removal is it is temporary. If you're going to do it, you have to do it constantly. I do, though, advocate trapping during the trapping season and letting trappers trap on your land unless you're just strictly opposed to it. Keeping species like coyotes wary of humans is a good thing. It causes less human coyote conflicts in the long run. I was doing a research project with coyotes. I was trying to radio call them and I would go out and find an area full of sign and tracks and we'd set it. And I might catch one, but then they're all gone. They're gone, just gone. The so traffic pushes them away and they definitely learn from that. A lot of people um, want the coyotes to go away, but they don't want to kill them. But um, really relocation, and we did this in Illinois. We took coyotes that were causing problems in the suburbs and we took them to the um, to the pres to the preserves, and within a week they were all dead. I mean, they just they, they cross roads they're not familiar with. They start to try to find a home range and throw them into a, a habitat that's already occupied that already has a pack or dominant individuals. And it's really they're not going to survive. So really, legal legal control is the only thing you can do. With all these things, removing the attractants is a key thing. Anything pet food, trash. Unfortunately, small dogs and cats are also attractants for coyotes. So you walk your small dogs on leashes or supervise and keep your cats indoors and I can get, get on my soapbox and give you a, about a dozen reasons why your cats should stay indoors for the environment, for the cats, for the birds and everything else. But coyotes are only one of many dangers that cat, outdoor cats face. There is a coyote frequently. Frequently in your backyard reinforces natural fear of humans. So you can scare it usually if it's not too ingrained in that habitat, but if it's too ingrained in that habitat already, it's really hard to get it to stop. So that's when you need to have someone take it out. But we're never going to get rid of coyotes in Ohio. 
We do have an open season on coyotes, so with a hunting license, and you don't need a trapping permit, you can hunt them 24-7. 365 days. So some of our other, our other canids, a red fox, it's found mostly in open areas, but along edges and woodlands, eat small mammals. Unfortunately, we've been seeing a decline in red foxes, kind of the opposite trend that we saw in coyotes. Coyotes and red foxes and wolves, well, all the dog species, all the canid species, have a natural hierarchy that's based on size. So wolves will kill coyotes, coyotes will kill foxes. If there was something smaller than a fox that was a dog-like species, they would kill it. So it's a competition-based thing, um, getting rid of the competition, and that's one of the reasons coyotes will go after dogs, too. Now the gray fox is the one I'm more worried about. This is one that shouldn't have been as affected by coyotes. It's smaller, it's more agile, it climbs trees like a cat. It lives in woods, it prefers brushy cover. Years and last year, the average was less than one per thousand hours. It was actually more bobcats on the bow hunters than last year than gray foxes. You know, red foxes prefer edges between woodlands and open fields. So edges that are allowed to be um, like an ecotone where two habitats meet um, instead of just a rough and uh, gray into each other. Gray foxes will work those edges too, but they prefer brushy areas in woodlands. Always maintain snags and hollow logs and um, some openings in the forest. And another thing, don't be surprised if a fox ends up in your yard this spring and has a fox under your deck. Because I saw this happening a few years ago with red foxes. I think it's one of the reasons why we're starting to see an upswing in red fox numbers is because the red foxes have started to den around people and have their pups around people. And I get more and more calls every spring that, hey, there's a family of foxes in my yard and they're not afraid and they're playing and they're just... And I said, well, one thing, um, you don't have any coyotes in your yard. And the other thing is they'll be gone in the fall. They just disappear. They mystify the people while they're in their yard. But the red foxes are smart. Uh, here's uh, one of our favorite critters of black bears is stay endangered, largest mammal in Ohio. Uh, you know, I hate that population estimated out. We always throw out 50 to 100, but we really don't know how many resident bears we have. I would say 50 might be a better guess. They're, they're rising really, really, really slowly, and um, I'm not sure exactly why. But many, we have a lot of bear sightings where they're actually just wandering males in from Pennsylvania and West Virginia. So. The thing with bears is they reproduce when they're two years old and they, they have about you know one to two cubs or two to three cubs and the cubs stay with them until their second summer and then the males disperse and the males will disperse for hundreds of miles if they have to find the territory but the females just move out and settle down next to vacant territory next to their mother so they don't go long distances so the males going through Ohio unless they may find all the all the good habitat and all the best habitat in the world, but if they don't find a girl, they're not going to stick with us. I give the analogy of like the teenage boy. They're looking, they're out there having a good time wandering around, everybody's seeing them. They're knocking over bird feeders, you know. But if they don't find any girls, they're not going to stay. So the population is just growing very slowly. But um, they are the smallest bear in North America. Males, 154 pounds. Females are smaller. Um, they have interesting tracks, um, five toes on all, on all four feet and a back foot that looks very human-like. Sasquatch even, if not for the cost. <laughs> you know, these are verified sightings, and they are trending to go up. The extent that they become visible is, it, is the extent they get into trouble, which is based on how much food is out there, what the soft mass looks like, what the hard mass looks like, and what the year is like. So if they don't have enough food, they're more likely to go to deer feeders and get their picture taken, knock down somebody's bird feeder, hit the garbage. But we do have some bear sightings in this part of the state. Most of them by far occur in the northeastern part of the state. Of course, it's, the Ohio River is not a barrier to bear movements, but it is a good bit easier just to walk across the state line in Pennsylvania. Um, they are not very carnivorous. They are mostly omnivorous. In fact, 70% of their diet is plants, berries, insect larvae. Um, and they like forests, and they like forests interspersed with openings and wetlands. Um, they like different types of forest succession because they can have, in mature forest they can have the hard mass in fall and in young successional stages they can have the berries in the soft mass in spring and summer. 
and there's an acronym to be bear aware, to act calm and not to run. You always allow space between you and the bear. If you're on a trail and the bear's coming your way, you move off the side. But if it should come toward you, you're, it's not like a grizzly bear where you're supposed to roll up and act dead and hope it buries you and leaves you alone. You raise your hands, you yell, you shout, you throw things at them, and you get out of there as quickly as you can. You have a good chance of a bear is being aggressive of scaring them off. I had a couple of bear encounters, both of them were in Tennessee. I had one where I was like eight miles out on a trail that was very lightly used. There were no other people on it, and that's why I took that trail, because I didn't want to be with other people. But there's a bear came down the hill and just stood in the path in front of me. She just stood there. And of course, I just rose and thinking I'm going to die. <laughs> so her two little folks come down, and they go on down the hill, and then she goes on down the hill after them. And then I'm like, wow, that was so cool. But at the moment, I was like, it, it, you, you don't remember this so much when you have, you're looking at a bear and there's nobody around. <laughs> Human death from a black bear since 1900. 17 people died from a spider bite, 25 from snake bite, 67 from dog attacks, 150 from tornadoes, 180 from bees and wasps, 374 from lightning strikes, and 90,000 were killed by other humans. <laughs> Substantially more dangerous from your neighbor and his dog than you are still getting killed by the <laughs> Long tail weasels, one of the weasels more likely to have in the woods. They say they're very aggressive, but I don't mean they're very aggressive toward people, they're just very voracious predators. Mustelas are in general. They usually prey on on the animals that are larger than themselves. And their tail makes up more than forty percent of their body, which separates them from the short tail weasels. And then there's the mink, which of course is a mustela, but it's, it lives in water, it breeds in water, it all has to have water. And river otters, of course, are completely um, bound to water. They were reintroduced in the 80s, late 80s, and they were removed from the endangered species list in 2002, and we started a limited harvest on them in 2005. Um, there are some things that you can look for in streams um, that would make it good um, river otter habitat. So points of land or projections perpendicular to the stream. Um, those are nice places for them to play and to have the trees. Backwater um, areas, tributaries, beaver activity, uh, naturally bending, meandering channels, logs. Logs are also good for mink because they like to um, enlarge rocks because they'll actually have their burrow in and make their dens under fallen logs and, and rocks. And then shallow pools for moving water. Okay, my favorite, bobcat. <laughs> so it feeds primarily on rabbits, small rodents, but especially voles, squirrels. Um, will eat carry on, but only during the winter. They were extirpated, or they were statewide pre settlements, and the state was almost completely forested. They were extirpated by the mid 1800s. We didn't see them come back until over about 100 years. It was 1949, an adult male was killed uh, along the Ohio River in Sayuga County. They were officially protected on the state danger list in 1974. We didn't really see them recovering until 2000. So I did get a lot of questions when we delisted them. They used to work for the Fish and Wildlife Service as an endangered species biologist. And the purpose of having any species on a threatened and endangered list is to take it off the threatened and endangered list. And the list helps us focus our time, focus our money. And so um, once the animal is recovered, we want to get them off and focus our attention elsewhere. As much as I'd like to work with bobcats for the rest of my year, and the rest of my life, or my career, it's time to move on and, and try to give, try to see what's going on with the gray foxes. That's some of the reasons why we delisted. You can see the this is the, the increase after 2000 in bo verified bobcat sightings. That's that's 2010. That's 2014. It looks like the same trend, except this goes up to 250, and this one goes up to 120. So we went much higher in just a few years. And when bobcats cause depredation issues, it's usually that they're killing poultry. You can see that in light color. This is their main um, district, their main uh, habitat in Ohio is the southeastern unglaciated region. We do have some, we have some verified sightings out in other counties, especially along the river, and some maybe came down from Michigan. But I didn't expect to see this in 2014 where we had unverified sightings almost all over, uh, over half the state. I'm now starting to think that wherever there's a patch of suitable habitat, even if it's the middle of farmland, we're going to have bobcats in it. So managing for bobcats, woodlands interspersed with openings and early successional stages. They need those early stages. They like mature forests. They certainly hunt squirrels, but 
the, the cover for, for Nagel Jones. Sum it up, um, maintain healthy, diverse woodlands, diversity of successional stages so it gives you a lot of different types of wildlife. There's always the good things about stumps, logs, snags, and healthy, meandering, unchannelized streams. But we don't want to encourage carnivores by feeding them or bringing them, uh, keeping our garbage or pet food outside. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Mountain lions are moving eastward. They certainly are. There are some sightings, verified sightings in Illinois, maybe one in Indiana, but they, we haven't had a verified sighting in Ohio yet. Um, I don't, I think eventually we will, but with all the trail cameras out there, every owner and their brother has a couple of trail cameras. And I have not yet gotten a, a clear, verifiable picture of a mountain lion. And I'm waiting for it. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. I'm hoping that we have one before I retire or die. Why is it in old paintings and pictures of kings and queens that were in ermine robes? Is it just the rarity of the fur? How did ermine become royal? You know, what I find amusing, too, is those old uh, movies, maybe from the 40s and 50s, that are black and white, and, and women would wear uh, not just a, a shawl, but an entire, entire box, pelt, legs, head, tail, and everything around them. I'm thinking, put an entire dead carcass around your neck. And, you know, <laughs> but that was the style, though. That yeah. was fancy. Yeah. You know, yeah. but it's just this, and, and style and fashion, and they impact Around the world, they impact the fur, fur industry amazingly. Thanks to what's in style in China or Russia will impact right. what furs, what price furs bring in Ohio. I have had verified reports last year. I had three verified reports of Fisher, and one of them was in Athens County, and one was in Meigs. So, so did they come across the Ohio River from West Virginia? They, they must be. They're, they're in West Virginia, and they're in Pennsylvania. And that's another one. We, they are, Still considered extirpated until we have proof of a reproducing population, but we're getting more sightings here and there. I think mm -hmm. last year was a big year in the three. But we thought they were showing up in northeastern Ohio, but they're showing up down here. The coyotes did not want to deal with 170 pound dogs. So. Yeah, llamas and donkeys apparently are helpful too. Mm -hmm. So okay. llamas are good with coyotes because coyotes don't want to get hurt. But mm -hmm. Stray dogs, yellow, red, and we were having trouble. Even though we were worming that llama every month with that deer worm disease, oh yeah, and he got paralyzed. Oh, that's too bad. A few years ago, David Cobb visited Athens and talked about corporate control of our institutions in the United States and the problems that were resulting. Here is a clip from one of those talks that helped energize us. The United States is not a democracy, and I'll tell you something further. Part of the problem is because these large transnational corporations, and I don't mean the mom and pops, I don't mean those of you who may be, I'm talking about the huge mega corporations of today. Corporations are no longer merely exercising power. They are ruling us. As surely as masters once ruled their slaves, as surely as kings once ruled subjects, unelected and unaccountable corporate CEOs are ruling us because they are making the fundamental public policy decisions that affect our lives. They are making the decisions about how much toxins will be spewed into the air that we all have to collectively breathe, or the water that we all have to drink from. They're making the decisions about what our transportation choices will be. They're making the decisions about what our health care options will be, or evermore what they won't be. They're making the decisions about whether this country goes to war or not. He proposed a solution to this problem and invited individuals to join Move to Amend, a national movement to amend the Constitution of the United States to make clear that corporations are not persons protected by the Constitution and that money does not equal free speech. Some of us who attended his first talk were still in shock from the Supreme Court ruling on Citizens United that opened the floodgates for unlimited amounts of money to flow into elections from corporations and the very wealthy. 
Some of us were already working to stop corporate destruction of the environment and to reduce corporate control over agriculture, health care, energy, and foreign policy. Others were actively opposing corporate and state policies that threatened the land, water, and our community-based food and energy alternatives. Many of us were questioning whether our efforts were really making a difference. All of us shared concerns about increased control by corporations over our lives and our communities. In the discussions that followed, participants soon came to realize that the problem of corporate control is more serious than any one of us had realized and that each of us had only a part of that information. A diverse group of citizens in southeastern Ohio formed Democracy Over Corporations, referred to as DOC, to support the work of Move to Amend, to research and better understand the extent of corporate control, and to find ways to actively promote democracy. What has DOC been doing? During the last four years, DOC members have been researching and educating ourselves about the negative effects of unrestrained corporate power in virtually every aspect of our lives. We've been sharing this information with others. DOC holds monthly meetings in which we educate each other. DOC maintains an electronic mailing list to notify persons of future meetings and interesting developments. Presentations are periodically made to community groups on invitation. A website, democracyovercorporations.org, is available with information on DOC's purpose and activities. A video of David Cobb's talk on Democracy Over Corporations is available there. Information tables about DOC are set up at community events. Information affecting public policy is provided to elected officials and candidates running for public office. Public presentations and events are held on significant topics, on climate change solutions. DOC hosted a public showing of the documentary Carbon Nation, followed by a commentary by local inventor William Beale. Debbie Silverstein of the Ohio Single Payer Network explained the future of health care, including corporate problems and possible solutions. Greg Coleridge of the Northeast Ohio American Friends Service Committee explained how the debt-based money system created by private corporations is unstable and systematically transfers wealth from the many to the few. John Spahn, law director of Mansfield, Ohio, discussed the legal implications of citizens banning fracking activities in their communities. DOC affiliated with Move to Amend. At DOC's initiative, Athens City Council and the Democratic Central Committees of Athens, Morgan, Gallia, and Vinton counties passed resolutions supporting Move to Amend's proposed constitutional amendment. DOC members helped launch the Ohio Community Rights Network, calling for protection of the right to local self-government. A Bill of Rights Committee was formed in Athens to place on the ballot an ordinance to protect Athens City's water supply. The ordinance was passed by a majority of 78% in November. In December, a democracy school was held in Albany, Ohio to train 29 additional citizens to organize similar ballot initiatives. DOC member Greg Howard ran for Congress. Promoting information that I've been learning as a member of DOC, I ran for Congress in the 6th Ohio District primary. Sharing these ideas with community groups for only two months and spending less than $5,000, I received 27% of the vote. This wider acceptance of DOC's information affirms how receptive the general public is to the important information DOC is learning. My website, greghowardforcongress.com, is an educational project promoting solutions discovered through the research of DOC members. What have DOC members learned? And how are they responding? Members of DOC have learned that megacorporations dominate or control major policy decisions made in every economic and political institution in the United States. They also define and limit choices made in public education, research institutions, foreign policy, and national and state elections. Through their control of the media, they restrict accurate news and distort public policy discussions. 
we have identified four fundamental ways by which corporations undermine democracy. Corporate personhood rights. Corporations are a legitimate and important part of our economic and social system, but should not determine public policy. They are given permission from the state to exist via corporate charters on the grounds that they will provide goods and services to meet the needs and wants of people. The corporate model is the way we organize both for-profit and non-profit activities. Early in U.S. history, corporations were viewed as potential threats to democracy and had no constitutional protections. Corporations doing legitimate business and serving the public do not need constitutional protections. However, mega corporations have corrupted judges and the legal system to declare that corporations are protected as persons under the U.S. Constitution. Hiding behind constitutional protections, corporations have been able to infiltrate government agencies, prevent or delay government inspections of health and safety violations, hide illegal activities, undermine local economic development, misinform consumers about the dangers of their products and services, buy elections and escape responsibility for the extensive environmental destruction and human sickness and death they cause. Corporations have used constitutional protection that they have been inappropriately given by the courts to take over government and to make government serve their financial interests rather than the interests of the country and of its people. Corporate money should be kept out of elections so that politicians can be responsible solely to the citizens they represent. To make that possible, a constitutional amendment is essential. One that specifies that corporations do not and never were intended to have constitutional rights and that money is not speech. DOC members continue to work with Move to Amend to pass such a constitutional amendment to end corporate personhood and remove big money from elections. Elected officials, political organizations, and community groups are being educated about this effort and assisted in wording resolutions for discussion and vote in their communities and their governing bodies. Corporate control of our state and national governments. Using well-funded lobbies, lawyers, and politicians, megacorporations have come to dominate our departments of government, setting up regulatory agencies and drafting regulations that give themselves legal permission to extract community resources and to destroy the environment. They have put into place a complex layering of laws to strip citizens of their legal rights to govern their own communities and develop a sustainable future. Corporate lobbies are a threat to government by the people. The revolving door between corporations and governmental agencies must be closed. When government regulation is actually required, it belongs in the hands of communities affected by the regulations. Protection of the land, air, water, and individual liberties are fundamental rights of local communities. Governments have a duty to protect those rights on behalf of their citizens. When governments fail to protect the rights of people and the environment, on which those people depend, the citizens have the inalienable right to alter, reform, or abolish those governments in order to attain a sustainable future. DOC members are committed to exercising our constitutional and inalienable rights to say no to politicians who serve corporate interests at the expense of public interest, and to say no to so-called corporate rights. Working with the Ohio Community Rights Network, DOC members are recruiting and training citizens in Athens, Meigs, and Vinton counties to write and pass county charters to secure the right of self-government and to pass laws to protect the health and safety of citizens and the natural environment. These efforts assert the right of local community members to define the type of economic development they want and to deny that right to corporations and corporate-funded 
politicians. Corporate control of our monetary system. The term monetary system refers to the way in which money is created and circulated in the economy. Our current monetary system is producing enormous debt. Federal, state, and local governments are squeezed by debt, as are families, businesses, and students. Just what is the economy? The economy is exchange of goods and services among people, such as food for fuel and labor for rent. But we seldom barter, trading one thing for another. Instead, we use money. But where does this money come from? Nations generate money in two ways. Governments create money as money, or governments give banks the authority to create money as credit, loaning it into circulation. Let's look at these two options. When banks create money as credit, banks loan money into circulation. That money is then paid back to the bank over time, along with interest. In this way, more money is taken out of the economy by banks than is put in. But as long as lending stays ahead of repayment, the money supply grows and times are good. Even when times are good, debt is growing since all of the money in the economy is on loan. Through interest payments, money creation by banks transfers money from borrowers to lenders, distributing wealth from the many to the few. When loan making fails to stay ahead of repayment rates, the banks take money out of the system faster than they put it in and the money supply shrinks. Shrinkage of the money supply causes the economy to fall into recession or depression as it did in 1929. 2008, and many times in between. Business profits fall, jobs are lost, and the stability of the whole economy is threatened. This is the bust phase of the boom and bust business cycle, the inevitable result of money created as credit. When governments exercise their sovereign right to create money, indeed an unfulfilled constitutional responsibility in the United States, the money is spent directly into the economy, producing jobs to build and repair infrastructure, and jobs that provide high-quality government services. People in those jobs spend money into the private sector, allowing the entire economy to grow. When government creates money, the rate of money creation is tied to the rate of growth of the real economy, eliminating boom and bust cycles. No debt is involved with money creation, neither national debt nor personal debt increase, and government can begin to pay down the current national debt. So which system of money creation is better? A system of government-created money, which puts debt-free money into the economy as a public asset? or a system of bank credit in which all money is on loan as a public liability, generating ever-increasing debt levels. Since the 1913 adoption of the Federal Reserve System, money in the United States has been created by banks. DOC members believe that the current bank-controlled system is not democratic, it favors the few, and is not sustainable. For economic stability, Congress must take back control of our nation's monetary system. The National Emergency Employment Defense Act introduced into Congress in 2012 proposes to shift money creation from banks to the government, which will provide government with the resources to invest in the nation's infrastructure to create good jobs and reduce or eliminate federal debt. DOC members are working with the American Monetary Institute on this issue. Corporate consolidation of media and manipulation of public opinion. All major TV and radio stations, newspapers, and magazines are owned directly by a few mega corporations. Corporate advertising influences mainstream programming and the selection of news content. 
Public policy discussions and campaign advertising reflect the viewpoints of corporations, not people in local communities. Corporately financed national and state politicians, few of whom have any background in education, set school standards. Textbooks create a false reality of political and economic struggles in the United States and the world. They systematically omit vital information about the harmful effects of corporate activities and about people's struggles for democracy and independence from corporate control of their institutions. Corporations heavily influence research choices in schools of agriculture, medicine, economics, and finance. Though much of this research is paid for by taxpayers, it rarely provides citizens with the information they need to evaluate the safety of corporate activities and products or develop sustainable products for local communities. DOC members believe that the media must be free of corporate control in the reporting of news and public policy discussions. The media should offer opportunities for wide public discussion and all public policy issues. Until the media is free of corporate control, local community groups, including DOC, must promote discussion of public policy issues. Based on the amazing information that members are learning, DOC has an important story to tell a story that corporate controlled media chooses to exclude. Our story is about how mega corporations are causing the problems we have, that solutions already exist, and that people working together can make the changes that are so badly needed. To increase our ability to promote discussion of public policy, members of DOC with the help of our friends in the wider community, are preparing educational videos to provide information in easy to obtain and learner-friendly formats. Videos will be suitable for individuals, families, groups, classrooms, and the internet. They will be accessible for free on our website and on the internet. They will also be available on DVD for purchase at low cost. The first two videos have been completed and are now located on our website. More videos are in production and will soon be available. A series of seven more videos will discuss the major economic and political institutions that megacorporations are controlling. These videos will include instructional guides to help promote public discussion and empower citizens to make changes. These seven videos will go beyond existing single issue videos to identify the root causes of our problems and provide solutions people can implement. Single issue efforts, as important as they are, are often discouraging and exhausting as corporate interests continue to win. DOC seeks to support these issues by reframing them in a way that confronts corporate control on a powerful single front, people's constitutional rights. DOC's commitment to the future. In DOC, we continue to study the complex issues relating to democracy and corporate power. But learning needs to merge with action. Organizing needs to cross divisions that often separate people. Class, age, race, political parties, and liberal, conservative, radical viewpoints. DOC believes that members of all communities want clean air, water, and land and they want to promote local economic development that provides a living wage. To reclaim our democracy, we will need to use it.
DOC members are committed to making decisions in ways consistent with democratic principles in public, where those affected by governing decisions are the ones who make them. Majority rule works best when fully informed by open debate, which includes minority opinions. All points of view must be voiced and considered so that decisions formalized through voting are intelligent solutions to real problems. The obstacles to democracy are formidable, but DOC members believe that informed, concerned, and well-organized people are more powerful than all the corporate money and their well-paid lawyers, lobbyists, and politicians. The cost of doing nothing has simply become higher than the cost of taking action. Therefore, we declare independence from corporate control over the economic and political activities in our communities and are working to restore democracy and sustainability. As we work together to end corporate control in government and in our lives, we must recognize that important gains made at local levels are not enough. For our communities to be sustainable, we need to finish the American Revolution, making people sovereign with the right to regulate corporations and the power to replace leaders not serving the public interest. Would you like to help finish the American Revolution? If you believe that people, not corporations, should govern their communities, we would like to work with you. Would you like to know more about Democracy Over Corporations? Our website, democracyovercorporations.org, includes information about the organization and its activities. Would you like to invite someone from DOC to talk to your group or have a DOC information table at your event? If you are already working on one or more of the same issues, we would like to explore with you ways to make our efforts more effective together. You can contact us at democracyovercorporations at gmail.com or write to us in care of APJN, 18 North College Street, Athens, Ohio, 45701. Thank you for your interest in Democracy Over Corporations and all that you are already doing to protect our planet for our children and to return democracy to our institutions and our communities. The members of Democracy Over Corporations look forward to working with you.